Hello everybody and welcome back. I am with the one and only Dr. Tom O'Brien who is the world's expert on gluten intolerance and things that we all need to know and he's also a, a dear personal friend of mine uh, who I love seeing in person. Tom, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you, Pedro. It's a real honor to be on your show. Thank you. So we are, um, you know, so you and I didn't get a chance to hang out while we were filming this movie. And man, are you going to be all over my next movie because you have uh, one of the strongest voices in the space and you have really been holding it down for where food has been impacting our health specifically gluten, which has been where you've uh, you know, done a lot of work. But I really want to talk about this because there's a big piece of the movie, obviously, that is all about the, the Franken food and what we've done to the food supply and how that is now kind of pulling us away from uh, our vitality and our abundance. And so people are really confused about this. And so I just want to kind of roll up our sleeves and talk about the, the science, the, the, the why, and then the how to get out of that mess. <laughs> Sounds great, and I'm rolling them up. <laughs> All right, I'll do the same. Let's get to work. <laughs> Excellent. So let's start with gluten, which is kind of the, the big bad one, and let's kind of dispel some of the myths and talk about really what's happening with it. Because you're, you're the founder of the Gluten Summit. You deal with the experts in the gluten space, uh, you being one of the, the experts yourself. And there's a lot that your conventional doctors just do not know about what's going on here. They think it's either celiac or nothing. Uh, they poo-poo it, and, and you've been really up on the science uh, for uh, a long time, and that's what you've made a career out of. So let's just let's jump in. All right. Well, the first thing I would say is that gluten is not bad for you. Bad gluten is bad for you. Mm. That There's gluten in rice. There's gluten in corn. There's gluten in quinoa. Gluten is the term for a family of proteins. It's an umbrella term about the gluten content of quinoa. And there are many proteins in quinoa that fall under the category of glutens. There are many proteins in corn that fall under the umbrella term gluten. So it's the wrong word, actually, to say gluten sensitivity. And it's kind of like handing someone a piece of paper and saying, would you please Xerox this? Well, that's the name of a company, <laughs> but, but it's, it's become in our common culture an action step. And it's the same with the word gluten. Gluten's not bad for you, but bad gluten is. And everyone needs to know that because somewhere down the road, if you go gluten-free and you feel better, you're going to read that rice has gluten and people panic. Oh, my God, have I been poisoning myself? Because they've started to understand some of the mechanisms of what goes on internally, and they'll, they'll panic. So don't panic. It's the gluten in wheat, rye, and barley that are undigestible by any human. No human can digest wheat, rye, or barley. That doesn't mean it makes them all sick, but it can't be digested completely. If you think of proteins like a pearl necklace, hydrochloric acid, when we chew our food and swallow it, hydrochloric acid produced in the stomach undoes the clasp of the pearl necklace. Now you have a string of pearls, the necklace. There are enzymes in our digestive tract that act as scissors to cut off each pearl. That's called an amino acid. So that the pearls that can then go through the intestines be absorbed into the bloodstream. The problem with the gluten proteins of wheat, rye, and barley is that no human has the scissors to cut off each pearl. So we, don't, we can't access the individual amino acids. And what happens is that we cut off clumps of the pearl necklace. So you get a 33 clump uh, piece, a 33 pearl piece of the necklace, a 17 pearl piece, an 11 pearl piece. They're called peptides. And those peptides are toxic to the digestive tract and will stimulate inflammation. And that's the initiating mechanism in the intestinal tract that eventually will cause systemic problems for many people. The other part of that is that um, it's, wheat has saved millions and millions of lives, you know, and we can't ignore that. Um, when African countries have had famines, we've shipped shiploads of wheat, containers of wheat uh, over and fed nations and kept people alive. 
So we can access some of the protein in wheat, but it's poorly accessed, and the 33 pearl, the 17 pearl, the 11 pearl causes inflammation in the gut, which eventually causes something called intestinal permeability, or the leaky gut is the slang term, and then the whole cascade of effects that occur systemically as a result of that. Okay, so let's back up real quickly because there's been uh, a lot of talk about how we've messed with the crops and now because we've messed with the crops uh, this is creating uh, th this huge problem and so has it always been indigestible and it's always been now it's the new stuff the new kind of symphony of, of messy chemicals and, and other foods that are also pro-inflammatory that are letting the uh, gluten clumps or the peptides uh, become uh, the standout or or what like let's let's back up to caveman days and come back forward quickly Good. That's really a good point. The the earlier forms of wheat, the monoploids, um, uh, uh, emmer, uh, that came from uh, the Babylonian area, uh, they also are poorly digestible, but not as difficult as the current crops. The current crops have more gluten in them. They're more gluten means glue, and it's the glue that when the bread rises, it makes lighter, fluffier breads that don't collapse. The glue holds the particles together as it rises from the yeast. And so the more gluten, the more glue, the lighter the product, the more marketable it is. So, uh, so some people have said, well, I'll just get the earlier forms of wheat that are uh, somewhat available nowadays, or I'll just sprout the wheat, or I will... Um, uh, use sourdough, I'll ferment it a little bit more. And those things do help reduce the difficulty in digesting the protein. The complication is once you've produced the antibodies, once your immune system has said this is a problem, you cannot go to the earlier forms because you still get the 17 pearl clump in the earlier forms that your body is making an immune reaction to. So even though you don't have the hundreds of amino acid long complex wheat of today, if you're eating the earlier forms, if you have already made antibodies to the wheat that you've been currently eating, the earlier forms of wheat will still trigger that same immune response. Okay, so now once your body creates antibodies to a certain clump, substance, peptide, whatever, really party's over because now forever it's going to recognize it as foe. It's the basis of immunizations. When we get a shot, a uh, measles vaccination, they give you a shot of the bug measles. Your brain says, well, what is this? This is not good for me. And your brain says, you, general, and in your immune system, you've got Army, Air Force, Marine Corps generals sitting around with nothing to do, right? You, general, you now are general measles. Take care of this. General measles builds an assembly line. The assembly line starts producing soldiers. Those soldiers are called antibodies. And they are trained as assassins to go after measles, nothing else. They just go after measles in the bloodstream. Now, your bloodstream's a highway. There's lots of traffic on the highway, and there's no lanes of traffic. You know, they're just bouncing into each other, but they're all going the same way. So you've got these antibodies firing these chemical bullets called cytokines, destroying measles. They're trained to look just for measles. When all the measles bugs from the vaccination have been destroyed, general measles who is watching all of this is, all right, turn off the assembly line. We don't need more soldiers out there right now. You shouldn't have measles antibodies in your bloodstream right now, unless you've been exposed, and then you should. But General Measles is now vigilant the rest of his life. That's his only job. If measles ever comes on the scene, he just has to flip the switch. He doesn't have to build the assembly line anymore. That's why if you go to Africa, you need vaccinations months ahead of time, as you know, months and months ahead of time, yellow fever, dengue fever, all these strange things. But if you go back 10 years later to visit again, you just need a booster shot two mm. weeks before you go. You just have to wake up the system again. Well, we've got General Gluten who built the assembly line. It's called a memory B cell. It never goes away. So once you've started producing the antibodies to gluten and you have elevated antibodies to any of the peptides of gluten, and there are many, any of the peptides of gluten, party is over. As you say, party's over, you're done with gluten. 
because if you're ever exposed, general gluten, who's vigilant, will just flip the switch and here come the antibodies. One exposure, Pedram, one exposure, a milligram, which is an eighth of a thumbnail, a milligram is all it takes to turn general gluten back on, turn the assembly line on, you start producing these soldiers, and then for three to six months, you've got elevated antibodies causing internal tissue damage. That right there is a huge piece that I want to just kind of stop and, and, and breathe on for a second because I know so many people that are gluten intolerant say that say, well, I just had a small bite. Like, what's the big deal? I didn't eat the whole pizza. And you have to stop and say, well, you're missing, you're missing the fact that this is a, an immunological cascade that you set off and it has nothing to do with what has already processed out of your stomach, but the army, it just woke up. That's exactly right. And, you know, the problem with gluten, if you have a sensitivity, is not that it gives you a sore tummy. I mean, so what? I don't mind having a little bloating, you know, to enjoy a pizza. If I'm going to gorge on pizza, I don't mind if I feel a little bloated. If I were to do that, you know, it's a small price to pay. The problem is you pull at a chain, the chain breaks at the weakest link. It's at one end, the middle, the other end. It's your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidneys. It's the autoimmune mechanisms that get set up from an exposure to gluten when you're sensitive to gluten. It's those autoimmune mechanisms and you start producing elevated antibodies to your thyroid or elevated antibodies to your brain. In my practice, I took 316 consecutive patients. That meant everyone that came in, no screening, if they were two years old or over, and I did a blood test on them. And one of the things I looked at was antibodies to your brain. And I looked at myelin basic protein, which is the, when you have elevated myelin antibodies, that's the mechanism that causes MS, eventually, when there's enough tissue damage. I looked at cerebellar antibodies, that's the area of the brain that controls our muscle movement. So when you see elders that don't walk very solidly on the earth, they're guarded walking downstairs, they don't have that dance of life in their step, pep in the step anymore. That's the cerebellum that may not be functioning very well. So I did 316 patients. 26% of everyone that came into my office had elevated antibodies to their cerebellum. Oof. 26%. I mean, one out of every four. So, so let's, let's bring this into layman's terms. Elevated antibodies to the cerebellum means... Your immune system is firing chemical bullets called cytokines at the cerebellum, destroying the cerebellum. Your right. brain. <laughs> your brain. Your brain. And when you destroy, you know, you destroy 10 cells, 100 cells, there's no big deal. I'm, I'm going to make up a number. You've got uh, 800 million cells uh, in your cerebellum. I'm just making a number up. I don't know what it is. But you destroy a thousand cells today because you've got elevated antibodies, no big deal. A thousand cells tomorrow, no big deal. But in 10 days, that's 10,000 cells. In 100 days, that's a million cells. In one year, that's 3 million cells. You've got 800 million. Well, if you do 20 years of 3 million cells a year, that's uh, 60 million cells. Is that going to affect how your brain functions and how the control goes to your feet? And how balanced you feel on the earth. Do you start stumbling when you're in your 60s? Oh my gosh, I just lost my balance. Yep. That's the one of the mechanisms that can set that up. You're attacking your brain. Mm. Or if it's MS. MS, uh, the myelin antibodies. Myelin is the saran wrap around your nerves. And what happens when you have elevated antibodies, and it was 18% of those 316 patients had elevated uh, myelin antibodies, 18%. When you attack your myelin, think of the wire that goes from the battery of your car to the headlight of the car to give it juice. If you take the insulation off of that wire in the middle somewhere and that wire touches the metal of the car, the lights will flicker on and off. What's wrong with the lights? There's nothing wrong with the lights. It's the wire. Mm. That's MS. That's when people can't walk very well. They, they can't feel things. They, uh, that's the symptoms of MS. So it, and, you know, as we all know, autoimmune diseases don't occur overnight. Alzheimer's does not occur overnight. It's a decades-long process of killing off your brain, mm. slowly killing off your brain. Mm. And the problem with gluten is that it's the primary food that's been identified, the primary environmental trigger that sets off the inflammation that causes the intestinal permeability that is the gateway 
in the development of autoimmune diseases. So here's an example that I think we'll have some fun with, is what if this was like, say, TSA, and you're walking through the airport security, and all of a sudden, uh, there's some bad guys walking through, and the TSA guards get really nervous about who's the good guy and the bad guy. Sometimes they'll grab some innocent citizens and chuck them over into the bin and start, you know, searching and seizing and doing all the things that they do, because now we're kind of in wartime and everyone's escalated. So the, the thing that I think we need to just kind of accentuate here is once you set off one of these elevated cascades and that, that this war in the gut, the problem is it goes to places that you might not like, like parts of your brain, the myelin and all these things. And so neurodegenerative disorders, Alzheimer's, all of these things that we're seeing that are just all over the place in the medical system. How much of this can we start tracing back to saying, holy crap, this is where it might have started? Autoimmune disease is commonly accepted as the number three cause of getting sick and dying. You know, we think of them separately. If you have psoriasis, you go to a dermatologist. If you have MS, you go to a neurologist. If you have rheumatoid, you go to a rheumatologist. They're, they're all in separate silos, you know, but the mechanism is the same. And it's the number three cause of getting sick and dying. General MS, uh, uh, general myelin, general cerebellum general gluten. They don't go away. Mm. They're vigilant the rest of their lives. So you have one bite of pizza. All you need is an eighth of a thumbnail. There was a paper, a milligram of gluten a day. That's about an eighth of a thumbnail. A milligram of gluten a day keeps the villus healing away, meaning your intestines don't heal. Mm. They just don't heal. And general gluten, general myelin, general cerebellum, general thyroid are with you the rest of your life. They're there to protect you. So they're there to stay. We have to negotiate uh, a, a new strategy in dealing with them and how we ingest because that's just biology. That's I didn't make the rules. Neither did you. Um, so what? First of all, how did we get into this mess? I mean, how did it get to be so bad? Is it because we? farmed and over farmed and made one type of food a staple that we overwhelmed our systems with or has it always been this way but we just didn't really have that much gluten in our diet to begin with or sorry wheat in our diet to begin with good catch uh uh no no actually um they've done a number of studies on that because there are some people diagnosed with celiac disease that's when you have a gluten sensitivity that causes your intestinal damage uh that's the most commonly known one and people diagnosed with celiac, so then they je then check the siblings. And the siblings are checked. Uh, it's a tube that goes down your throat, and they look at the intestines, and they snip a little piece and look at it under a microscope. And the siblings don't have celiac disease. So the doctor says, it's fine to eat wheat. It's fine. Well, 15 years later, the siblings have celiac disease. And that hap that's happened again and again and again and again. In other words, you're not born with the disease. It develops over time. And so they've looked at... What is it that's triggering? How come at age 21 you didn't have this, but now at age 36 you do? What, what happened to that person in that 15 years? And what they've discovered is that it's a loss of oral tolerance, meaning it's a loss of the ability to eat this food that's not good for you and for the body. Oh, it's not good for you, but it's no big deal. Let's just send it back out and you eliminate it. The loss of the ability to tolerate is when the immune system gets activated. And that loss of oral tolerance occurs because we are exposed to so many toxic things in our world today. From the plastics that our water comes in when you buy water bottles, to the heavy metals in the fish that we eat, to the chemicals in the air, to the arsenic that's in the rice uh, that we're eating today, that the list goes on and on and on of all of the different ways that this human machine is being exposed to really bad gas and bad oil, that it doesn't let the body run the way it should, so that the immune system, your immune system's the armed forces in the body. It's there to protect you. You know, there's an army, an air force, a marines, a coast guard. It's there to protect you. And it's on hypervigilant overdrive. It's like 9-11. The day after that terrible day, the whole country was on alert, and we've been on alert to some degree ever since. But that first week, month, year, everyone was on high alert looking everywhere, looking everywhere. That's what the immune system is doing. When you start making elevated antibodies to gluten, 
you've lost the ability to say, oh, it's not that big deal. Let's just watch it, but let it go on its way. It's a loss of oral tolerance that's caused the increase in the recognition and diagnosis of this. So there's, there's a chance before the commissioner picks up the bat phone to call it off, <laughs> right? And, but once, it's, once that phone call is made, then the troops have been deployed and the general is going to work to the end of your days and you will have an intolerance to whatever that substance is that you've now created antibodies to. That's exactly correct. That's what the immunologists tell us. Now, there is some anecdotal evidence that when, I mean, meaning uh, experience, but not testing, just experience. There is some evidence that when people do a, a comprehensive detox program and they clean up their lives and all of the stuff that they're exposed to, that some of the things that were setting them off before no longer set them off and they don't have the symptoms that they were getting before. There is some evidence of that, but there's no science yet that confirms that it's safe because you can't feel when the myelin is being attacked or the cerebellum or your thyroid mm. or wherever it is. You can't feel it, so you have to check for it. And there's only been two papers that I'm aware of that has shown uh, um, that when a person does a detox and gets those offensive things out of their bodies and out of their exposure field, that the antibodies go down. There are many papers showing that the antibodies go down to your thyroid. The antibodies go down to your brain. There are many papers published in the medical literature that you can stop. Uh, the term they use is arrest. Arrest the development of autoimmune disease when you stop throwing gasoline on the fire, you know, when you stop eating the foods that your body is sensitive to. But there's been no papers yet that have shown once you've cleaned it all up, if you get a little exposure once in a while and you don't have any symptoms, it's okay to have a little exposure. There's been no papers that have looked at did the myelin antibodies go back up? Did the thyroid antibodies go back up? No one's published on that yet. That's coming. There's a couple of studies in place now that are looking at that, but it'll be another year or longer before those are published. So I could, I could feel the wishful thinking out in our audience right now. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Pizza, please bring it back. Right. But, but I guess what we're hearing is until further notice, pizza's off the menu if you have a gluten intolerance because we don't know, but what we do know is general pizza is always going to be at work. Um, and, and the implication that a detox can possibly desensitize that system and give us the opportunity to uh, get a fresh start is, is, is wonderful. I mean, I, look, we've all done detoxes. Um, you know, I feel wonderful when I clean out my, my body and all that, and my body has a lot more resilience but whether or not there's an anti-myelin antibody being produced in the, backs, in the back alleys of my bloodstream that are still hitting my brain uh, is, remains to be seen. It's not worth the risk. Exactly. It's not worth the risk because when you destroy the myelin, it's destroyed. Right. right? And if you've got general myelin, you don't want to mess with general myelin. You don't want to mess with general cerebellum or general thyroid. You just don't want to mess with that tissue. And so... You, you just check. My message is always the same. I never, ever say everyone should go off gluten. I never say that. What I say is everyone should, if you're not happy with how your body's functioning, everyone should be properly tested to see, should I be off gluten? So now what's the test? Because a lot of people here, and, and we've had a lot of these problems, you and I have talked about this offline, is you know a lot of doctors don't even know what tests to run. They'll run bad tests that don't really give conclusive evidence and all that. So what would be uh, uh, the right testing to do, to ask your doctor to do, to help you with this? Oh man, my uh, staff person was sitting next to me last Saturday when I was lecturing in Indianapolis. And uh, um, I, we, we were listening to the other keynote uh, before my lecture, who's a world famous expert on celiac disease, who was saying that the test for celiac is transglutaminase. That's the name of the blood test you do to see, uh, do you have celiac disease? And he was saying that uh, if transglutaminase comes back negative, don't worry about it, you don't have a problem. And I, I was just fuming because there are many, many studies to show Okay, to answer this, I've got to give you a little background sure, first. Sure, bring it, yeah. Think of the digestive system, a donut. If you could stretch one donut out, just stretch it out and look down the hole of the donut, that's your digestive tract. It goes from the mouth to the other end. It's one big long tube. 
The inside of the tube is lined with shag carpeting. This shag is where calcium is absorbed. This shag vitamin C. The shags over here may be the good fats. These shags proteins. All the shags absorb different nutrients. Celia, and the shags are called microvilli. Celiac disease is when the shags wear down, you got berber. Mm. If you've got berber, you don't absorb calcium. You get osteoporosis. It's not rocket science. That's why in the Archives of Internal Medicine, they published a study that said every osteoporotic patient needs to be checked for celiac disease as celiac disease could be the cause of their osteoporosis. You just don't absorb your nutrients and then you develop the disease of that nutrient deficiency. Mm. It's so very common, right? So transglutaminase is a blood test that is 97, 98, 99% accurate, almost 100%, some studies 100% accurate, when your shags have worn down and you've got Berber. That's celiac disease. So if you have celiac disease, almost all of the time the transglutaminase blood test will be elevated. The problem is, when you look at the studies, if the shags are only partially worn down, called partial villus atrophy, or if they haven't started wearing down, you've got the inflammation that's the mechanism and it's going to town and it's going to start real soon, then the transglutaminase test is positive, accurately positive that you've got a problem somewhere between 27 and 33% of the time. And you get a false negative almost seven out of 10 times. Mm. So if you do the transglutaminase test and it comes back negative, the only thing a doctor can be sure of is that you do not have total villus atrophy. You don't have Berber. But you might be well on your way. Exactly. So to have a world expert say, if you don't have a transcontaminase problem, don't worry about it. It's okay to eat wheat, was just utter nonsense. It was nonsense. So, uh, but when that test first came out in 1997, the paper said 100%, 97%, 99%. Why does it say that? Because the researchers that wrote those papers, they looked for people with celiac disease. To get the diagnosis of celiac disease, you have to have total villus atrophy. Those are the only people that get the diagnosis of celiac disease. So the blood test showed 199, 97% of the time, it correctly identified you got a problem. Right. So it's a great, great test. But since then, other papers have come out and said, wait a minute, guys, wait a minute. And there are many papers on this that say partial villus atrophy, the test is not accurate. So you cannot use transglutaminase as the indicator of whether you have a problem or not. If transglutaminase comes back positive, you got a problem. No question, you got a problem. But if it doesn't, we have to look for a bigger picture, a more global blood test. And that came out and was available uh, four years ago. It came out four years ago. And remember I talked about the necklace, the gluten necklace, and that we can't cut the pearls into individual amino acids. We don't have the scissors to do that, so it comes into clumps. 33 uh, pearl clump, 17 pearl clump. The blood test to look for a sensitivity to gluten has always looked at the 33 pearl clump. It's called alpha gliadin. So there's 33 a bunch pearl. of other peptides that they're not even looking at. Exactly. <laughs> well, finally, a test came out four years ago. It's from cyrexlabs.com, and they look at 10 different peptides of gluten, not just one. And you rarely get a false negative now, rarely. So that's the test. It also looks at transglutaminase. So that's the test you do to identify, do you have celiac? Do you have gluten sensitivity? Or are you in the clear? Mm, mm. That's the test to do. Awesome. Yeah, you know, the thing is, what people need to understand about medicine is that it is a work in progress. <laughs> and we're learning that. stuff every single day. So just because your doctor said something with utter confidence three years ago doesn't mean that they were, weren't categorically wrong and it wasn't malintent or, or, you know, it's just we're learning things every day. So you got to stay up with it. Well, see, exactly right. That's why I travel the world teaching physicians. But doctors don't have the time when they're in clinical practice to be reading all the research papers. What they read is what the pharmaceutical rep comes in and they bring them lunch so they get 15 minutes with the doc and they're very grateful and they, they want to talk about two or three different drugs or something. So they'll show them a paper. So the laboratory reps that come in and do the same thing, they show them a paper and they've highlighted transglutaminase, 98% sensitive and specific for celiac disease. And the doctor doesn't read the paper. He just looks at the highlights. Oh, good. I'm okay. glad to see we, we have a test available. So the doctor believes it. And if you ask the doctor, he'll say, no, 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 I read the paper. No, you didn't. 
Mm-mm. You read the highlighted line that the, that the sales rep showed you from the paper. Look here. <laughs> exactly, exactly, because they just don't have time to read all the papers. Mm. Mm. So, okay, so then we can go now, there's a test, and yeah, and Cyrex is a, a great lab, and neither of us have stock or anything in Cyrex, so we're not like product plug in here, but Dr. Vojdani is just, just great. There's a lot of really impressive people that are stepping into the space, and you know, just clear thinkers. Yes. And so you can go get this, and then you can have a definitive understanding of where you stand and what it is that you can and cannot eat, and then you can really guide your lifestyle decisions based on real data. That's exactly right. So you can find out, do I currently have a problem or not? And if you have a family history of celiac disease, it's been diagnosed, aunts, uncles, siblings, parents, and you do a test, you do this test, and it comes back negative, that's great. You're in the clear for now. But when do you cross that line of oral tolerance and you lose oral tolerance? If you have a family history, you should do the test every three years or so, because at some point you likely will go down in your ability to handle that food. Why? Because it's not occasional. You don't eat wheat as often as you eat artichokes. Mm. You know, you get toast for breakfast, sandwich for lunch, pasta for dinner, croutons on your salads, cookies, cakes, that uh, it's with us every day, multiple times a day, every day. You know, what's interesting is we had a, a very highly gluten-sensitive patient that I was dealing with, um, and I actually referred her to Datis Karazian, um, who's also a, a, kind of a, a key player in this space because I'm off making movies and having less time to play doctor. And what happened was, I mean, she definitely had the gluten sensitivity uh, issues that were coming from wheat in particular. And so then she looks at the list of foods that are acceptable to eat, and so she falls in love with buckwheat. Fast forward four months, now she's developed an intolerance to buckwheat because she was having buckwheat three, four, five times a day. That's exactly right. You know, uh, this concept of oral tolerance, when we're infants, toddlers, young children, until about the age of four or five, I believe it is, it might be a little longer, I'm not sure, the foods that we're sampling and tasting, every food that comes in that's new, our immune system in the gut is saying, is this friend or foe? Mm. Is this friend or foe? It's called oral tolerance. And, oh, that's celery, that's good for me. Oh, that's applesauce, that's good. Oh, whoa, whole, whoa, that's bisphenol A that's in the water that I'm drinking. That's not good. I better fight that. So the immune system is in, these ch- in our children is constantly determining what's friend or foe. Well, the problem with in that, your patient is that she didn't eat buckwheat when she was a kid. So uh, the body doesn't know. What is this? And now she's being overwhelmed with buckwheat. Uh, more often than just occasionally. And so it, your body can say, well, this, I'm getting flooded with this unknown. I better fight this thing. Um, it's, it's, it's like having too many immigrants right. you know, that, that have come in. It's, well, there's too much of them. Well, there's more of them than the local population, and they're going to start voting for their people, and then all of a sudden the local population is up in arms. Right? Mm-hmm. That that happens in our bodies also. And all of a sudden we start building resistance. We make antibodies to buckwheat. The other mechanism of what might have occurred for her is that she had intestinal permeability uh, from the days and years of gluten exposure that hadn't healed yet. And intestinal permeability, the shags of the shag carpeting have a cheesecloth around them. Uh, It's called the epithelial lining, the cheesecloth. And when you get tears in the cheesecloth, which is what gluten does, it causes tears in the cheesecloth. Now, see, as food's coming down, it's, this, it's these big, large molecules, kind of like a raspberry. You know, it all looks the same, all these molecules. The scissors of digestion cut off each piece of the raspberry, like single amino acids, that go right through the cheesecloth. But when you've got tears in the cheesecloth, you get larger molecules of food called macromolecules going into the bloodstream before there's been enough time for those larger molecules to be scissored off into mm-hmm. small molecules. These macromolecules get into the bloodstream and your body says, whoa, what's this? This is not good for me. I better fight this. I can't use this to make new muscle or new nerve hormones called neurotransmitters. I better fight this one. And now all of a sudden, you're allergic to tomatoes or you're allergic to buckwheat or you're allergic to corn. And and these are the people that do 90 food tests for allergies and they come back allergic to 15 or 20 or 25 different foods. And they say, oh, my God, that's everything I eat. Well, of course it is because you've got intestinal permeability, macromolecules are getting in, 
and your immune system is doing exactly what it's supposed to do, trying to protect you. Mm. And, 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 you. And they flooded the gates, and now they're on the other side where they shouldn't be. That's exactly right. And you have to heal the gut, and it all calms down. So let's talk about that, because I mean, we, we definitely touched on intestinal per permeability. It's really hard to, to do more than just touch on things in a movie, or else it'll be like six hours, and that's why we're doing this summit, and that's why I really appreciate your expertise, because people really need to know. I mean... Okay, so let's just assume that you find that you have an issue with gluten, you have an issue with specifically wheat or, or one of these molecules that is now creating an antibody and you got, you know, general general bread out there to get you. Um, this oral tolerance and this ability to reverse the leaky gut and this ability to kind of clean up our act and mitigate the exposure to start turning this ship around is where we really want to... Uh, encourage people to look obviously because it's one thing to say oh my god we blew it and you know it's all doom and gloom and the world's gonna collapse uh, which is where a lot of people go with the environmental movement but we really want to help people feel better so that they can help the people in their lives and make better informed decisions and shopping decisions and you know and look at things that are in on labels and say I don't want this in my body so where can we start turning this around uh, to get people out of this mess it, it starts with the realization that we, we, we have to take ownership of how to fuel this machine. And you may like key lime pie. You may really like it, right? Well, tough. You know, <laughs> uh, if it's made with wheat flour, and you, know, you, you just can't do it. So make key lime pie with other crusts. Well, I like it with this crust. Well... Do, do you like the myelin on your brain? Mm. You know, it's, it's like at some point we just have to take ownership that there are some things that we've done in the past really aren't good for us. You didn't know it wasn't good for you. Now you know. Avoid it. That's like saying, that's like saying smokers like cigarettes and alcoholics like gin. Understood. Uh, understood. <laughs> How many times have we heard of people uh, uh, that have lung cancer and they've got a tracheotomy and they're putting a cigarette in the hole here? I mean, I've heard this many times over the years that people do that. All right, well, you know, you, you can lead the horse to water. Right. And um, there's nothing else you can do about that. So it really is about treating these bodies as temples, if you will, that they're, they're holy vesicles to carry us through this lifetime. And what kind of food do we put in there really determines, to a large degree, how this body works for us. Love that. You know, it's funny is we were just together, I don't know, a couple weeks ago now at a conference and we got to hang out and go hiking and have this wonderful time. And uh, Abel James and Allison Bridge, who's his fiance, has have basically lived with me for the last two weeks and we were filming and doing all this stuff. And, you know, I was, gro I was basically complaining about the fact that pumpkin pie is one of my favorite foods and now it's out. And she said, I got this. So she made a coconut crust pumpkin pie with no dairy and duck eggs. And I mean, it oh. was just like finger licking good. And I just like, you know, this, this, this thing lit up in me where I was just like, pumpkin pie is back. You yes, know? yes, you want to cry. Yeah, it was so it's good. So <laughs> and, and that's the thing. It's like you, just because your favorite food has a couple ingredients that poison you doesn't mean that you can't get some ingredient swaps. And you know what, we'll, we'll get some of these for the, the uh, kit for the summit. And I'll just add some of these wonderful dessert swaps uh, for people to enjoy because it doesn't mean you have to suffer right it's like it's become this 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 culture of thou shalt nots and it's like what can i eat right yeah. versus making food pleasurable and just keeping the poison out you know uh 10 years ago it really was uh eating cardboard mm. uh, some of these gluten-free products tasted like cardboard and uh, the, the recipes weren't out yet the flowers weren't out but there are so many options available now as you know, it's a three and a half billion dollar industry, gluten free. Uh, so the commercial interests have gotten on board. So we've got almond flour now. We've got, uh, I don't know, lentil flours. I mean, you've got all these different flours that you can use, and the recipes are accessible. We'll make them available to you so that you can have a kit for your people of um, how do I transition? What do I do? 
Yeah, thank you, because that's the thing. It's like, look, guys, Dr. Tom's been out there doing this for a long time, and he's not the kind of guy that, that doesn't like to live life. I mean, I've been with them. You know, we go hiking. We do things that are, that are fun and conducive to life. And a lot of these people that are in the health space are just like shell-shocked into thinking, yes. you know, I'm, I, you know, walking around reading labels in, in grocery aisles thinking everything is out to get them. But I, I guess one of the empowering messages here that I'm hearing is go figure out what your body is specifically saying it doesn't like. Stop poisoning it with mercury and, and all the other junk that obviously is going to poison anybody. And then go back to living life and enjoying it. Yes, yes. And it's an education process, you know. And to become an expert in taking care of your body, you first have to graduate from high school. And then perhaps you graduate from undergrad university. And then perhaps you get a master's degree. And then perhaps you get a PhD. So you, the more you learn about how to take care of yourself, the more patient you are in taking care of yourself and understanding it's a learning process, you will find in the years to come you're stronger, healthier, more functional than you've ever been. I want to I want to talk about this for a second, and we're we're almost out of time. But you know, I think it's it's absolutely critical. As you're drinking, is that is that Sun Horse right there? Uh, it is. So so Dr. Tom has a, a wonderful adaptogenic herb formula that uh, he introduced me to that is is wonderful. So adaptogens can help build some of that tolerance, and I'd love to talk about that as well because one of the points that you made uh, earlier that, I, that I'm circling back to is, yeah, look, if, if all pizza did was give me a bit of a tummy ache, yeah, whatever, I'll just suffer through it and I'll take it once in a while. But how much energy goes into this internal war of this immune system and how much life are people missing by not realizing what the, the, the net energy cost is in creating this kind of antibody cascade. Because that, that, I think, is the part that people aren't correlating. And they're like, I'm moody, I'm tired, I have brain fog, I can't be as clear and focused as possible. And that's even before their brains deteriorate. Right, that's exactly right. And the vision that just came up for me um, as you were uh, posing the question is you've got a dam. And on the other side of the dam, there's a village down the hill there, mm. right? And you've got a little leak in the dam. Uh, just a little leak, a little water dribbling out, but the next week it's more water and that gets more. So you've got these antibodies attacking your brain. You can't feel it when the antibodies are attacking your brain. You just can't feel it until now there's some water coming through. Now you see, and oh my gosh, I've got brain fog most of the time or some of the time. And then there's more water leaking out, more water leaking. I said, we, we got a problem here. Wow, my brain's not working. Well, I guess I'm getting older. How old are you? I'm 38. No, no. <laughs> that ain't old, right? That ain't old, right, <laughs> right. But we accept this because we don't know what to do about it. And then eventually the dam breaks and it floods the village. And that's when you get a diagnosis of an autoimmune disease. So if we understand that there's a mechanism going on, you don't feel that mechanism. You can identify it with the right blood test. You can identify it, but you don't Feel it. You don't feel when you have that little pizza, your little tummy ache. You, know, you don't feel that's a big deal. But underneath, you've just increased the antibodies attacking your brain if that's the weak link in your chain, wherever the weak link is. So we have to get past how we feel as the indicator of whether we're taking good care. The other analogy would be if you don't take your car in for service unless it starts running bad. Well, that wouldn't make any sense, would it? Because the car won't last very long. Uh, you take the car in every 10,000, 15,000, whatever the service um, uh, calendar is, just to get checked up and adjust a few things. Well the, well, the car's running fine. I don't need to take it in. No, the light's on the dashboard saying I'm 600 miles over getting my checkup. So I, I take it in and the car runs great again. You know, you don't feel it when it's getting to that point. It's the same with our bodies. You just don't feel it. Well, that's why I got out, uh, and mo most people on the summit don't know my history, but I was the president of a, a large medical group, and we were doing really well, and I was just having a hard time sleeping because I only got paid when people were sick. And, you know, the entire industry is set up, the medical industry is set up uh, to clear that village once the dam breaks, right? And so it just didn't make sense to me that you had all these preventable things that were coming 5, 10, 20 years down the line that I can see 
clinically right now about to happen, but the insurance company wouldn't pay, the people didn't care, and the entire model was set up completely backwards, waiting for you know people to get shot and then show up with a mash unit, right? Let me give you an example. Yeah. Here's a great, because I'm smiling, you're saying it. Yeah. How many patients with Parkinson's do you know that have reversed their Parkinson's? Zip zero. Yeah, too yeah. late. Party's over. Right, but papers are now published that show the mechanism that's causing the Parkinson's that eventually develops the symptoms. The mechanism starts in the gut, and it's the lack of good bacteria in the gut called dysbiosis, and the, the, I won't go into technical stuff, but it's the imbalance in the gut that is the mechanism that sets all of this up. And that's the hottest research right now in Parkinson's. That's amazing. That's yeah, that, amazing. That's the example. I mean, you, if you wait until you've got the symptoms and the diagnosis, you're toast. And that's a pun, I guess. And it's not gluten. <laughs> it's not gluten <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so I, I would love to get your two cents on the microbiome. I know we, we talk about it a lot in the movie. A lot of people in the summer are going to talk about it. But in that oral tolerance uh, arena, how important is the microbiota and how important is it to help with the modulation of what is construed a crisis? It actually is what I teach, part of what I teach for the Institute for Functional Medicine and for all the physicians that come through our training programs. And there is no system of the body that has a greater impact on every other system of the body. Just think about this. We, we know that genes are the control of function. When genes get turned on, genes get turned off. Uh, people that have gene, the gene for cardiovascular disease, it doesn't mean they're gonna have a heart attack. It means they're more vulnerable to having a heart attack. With the breast cancer gene, doesn't mean they're going to get it or else every one of them would get it. It just means they're more vulnerable to getting it. Well, what turns on the gene? What turns off the gene? Genes control function. There are 10 times more genes. No, wait a minute. I want to make sure I get this right. There are 100 times more genes of bacteria in our gut than all of the human genome. There's 29,000 genes in humans, about 29,000. There's a hundred times that. And genes control function. So when we're having our second glass of wine after teaching all day sometimes, the discussion gets to be, are we really humans with a bunch of bacteria or are we bacteria having a human experience? Mm. Who, con who controls who? And the bacteria in our guts send out more messages to every part of our body. There are papers now on so many papers on brain function, depression, the development of Parkinson's, so many papers on cardiovascular function where the bacteria in the gene determines the function, has a major role to play in the function of the cardiovascular system. It is a crucial component. If you're only going to address one thing in your body, if that's all you're gonna do is one thing, what does it take for me to have a healthy microbiome? If you just have a healthy microbiome, by definition, that means you're not throwing gasoline on the fire, killing off the good bacteria, right? So you'll find out the foods that are good for you, the foods that aren't. What does it take to have a healthy mi microbiome? Most important. That's, see, that's where a lot of people are missing that, that equation of the oral tolerance, right? Is that the front line isn't even us, it's the friendly villages, the forces that, that coexist with us that's exactly right. And, That's exactly and, right. And, and, you know, every time you eat something that is antibiotic in nature, anytime you get overly mold exposed, as Dave Asprey was saying in, in, in his interview, and all these different things that, that damage your capacity to sustain a healthy neighborhood for those good bacteria, then you're putting yourself in a one-down position. Then you have a much higher likelihood for general bread or general pizza or general myelin to get called in is because your border's been compromised a long time ago. That's exactly right. That's a great visual for it. Great visual. Yeah. So, Dr. Tom, real quickly, what is the role of adaptogens and how they can help with some of this? Because I, uh, you know, you you know, I'm a big fan being a Taoist, and I, and you've got a formula that I'm a big fan of, and I'd love to just hear what adaptogens can do uh, in this in this fight against you know this uh, slide. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you. And um, uh, perhaps we can have another show on it. Uh, but really quickly, yeah. uh, adaptogens help you adapt. 
If you're too high, they bring you down. If you're too low, they bring you up. They help you adapt. So one person who has depression finds that their life is just easier. They, they, they feel more engaged with their life. They, do, they don't feel those waves of depression. The next person that has anxiety, taking the same adaptogens may find, you know, I've just noticed, actually I had a staff person yesterday say, you know, I just noticed in this last year that I'm not as anxious. I don't respond the way I used to. You know, I've had anxiety for years. I never would have thought of it until I, uh, as anxiety, but I read something. And I said, oh yeah, I guess I've got anxiety. And I thought about medications, but I've tried this product, and all of a sudden, I don't, I don't get anxious about stuff anymore. Um, so wherever we're out of balance, it's to help the body find balance by turning on the genes to help the body find balance. It's like the conductor of the symphony. You, you pick up, 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 down, 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 up, 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 down, down, down. Okay, like that's what adaptogens do. That's beautiful because what I'm hearing here is that, you know, first of all, adaptogens are, you know, class of herbs, right? These are plants, these things that, you know, that aren't being run by Monsanto, things that are growing naturally on the planet that we have been medicine for us for, for thousands of years. You know, they've been in Indian, they've been in Chinese, they've been in Native American um, culture. Uh, all, all of the things that we um, have known historically to work have constantly worked so you know there's what i'm hearing here and um i know there's one more thing is right now if you can mitigate your exposure to the toxins obviously we talk about this in the movie a lot if you can mitigate your exposure to the things that you know you're allergic to and then enhance with microbiota and enhance with adaptogenic herbs that help us that's like really putting yourself back in, a, in an advantaged position. So is there anything you'd add to that? That is exactly right, and that's a beautiful way of saying it. Um, uh, I know we're getting to the end of our time, and there's one more thing that I would love to talk about because this is affecting tens of thousands of people. Bring it on. Listen, man, you are, you are such a, a, a welcome voice in this chorus because I, just, I, I love how you synthesize stuff, so bring it on. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, so... Uh, Last year, there was a paper published, and the title of the paper um, was No Effects of Gluten in Patients with Self-Reported Non-Celiac Gluten Sensitivity After Dietary Reduction of Fermentable Poorly Absorbed Short-Chain Carbohydrates. A blogger in London saw that title and decided to blog, see, there's no effect of gluten. The science tells us there's no effect of gluten if you don't have celiac disease. What a, it's a fad. It's a fad. He didn't read the paper. Mm. And the London Times read his blog, and so a writer for the London Times then did an article in the London Times. And then it went to the Telegraph. Good. And then it went to the Wall Street <laughs> Journal. Good journalism, huh? <laughs> exactly. And then it went to the New York Times. And then it went to Forbes magazine. And then it's been to a number, number of um, other local newspapers where non cia gluten sensitivity is a fad, study says. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. It did not say that at all. So the first thing we have to remember about wheat is that there's lots of components to wheat. There's the protein, the family of proteins called gluten. There are carbohydrates, and the, the short term for it is FODMAPs. They're a type of carbohydrate. There's the oils, the fats. That's wheat germ oil. There's a number of different components in wheat when we eat it. What these authors were trying to do was to identify do the carbohydrates in wheat uh, um, create a problem for some people? Is it the carbohydrates? So what did they do? They, in selecting their audience, I've got my notes here, that in selecting the audience that they were going to use in their study, they first they took, they looked for, um, did anyone have a reaction to the protein of wheat? And, and in other words, elevated antibodies to the peptides of wheat. Well, yes, 37% of the potential study group had elevated proteins to gluten. They were not allowed in the study. <laughs> then they looked to see, did anyone have the genes for celiac disease? And yes, there was about 13% of them that had genes for celiac. Well, if you have the gene 40 to 50% of people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity also have that same gene. So it's not the celiac gene, it's the gluten gene. 
they were not allowed in the study. Come on. So they, they were trying to isolate groups of people who did not have an identifiable problem with wheat already, and they were not allowed in the study. I call that cherry-picking your group. Right. Which is a perfect thing to do because they were looking to see, do people have a FODMAP problem? So then they did their study, and they found out that every single person that had GI complaints, uh, irritable bowel syndrome complaints, bloating, gas, or diarrhea, every single person, when they took the FODMAPs out, they got better. So the title of their study, No Effects of Gluten in Patients with Self-Reported Non-Celiac Gluten Sensitivity After Reduction of the FODMAPs, the title was off. They shouldn't have said, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more thing. Even in that selected group, 8% of the people still found to have a sensitivity with gluten. Huh. Even, even when they took out all the ones that had the elevated antibodies, they found out there was still 8% that did. But they titled the paper, No Effects of Gluten. It should have been some effects or minimal effects of gluten. It was the wrong word to use in the title. And the same group, the next year, they published a paper that came out four months ago Randomized clinical trial, gluten may cause depression in subjects with non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Huh. And so they, the same researchers, they weren't saying that the protein doesn't cause problems. They were saying FODMAPs cause a problem if you have gut symptoms when you take everything else out. But they titled it confusingly. Hmm. So the blogger that wrote this whole thing, see, study says, and then all of the reporters that picked up on it, uh, just followed the blogger's lead without ever reading the study. And my frustration with that is that tens of thousands of people read the newspaper or they read the magazine that says, study says no such thing as gluten sensitivity. It didn't say that. Hmm. What, it, what it was talking about was FODMAPs. So I want to be very clear for people out there. Yes, of course, there is non-celiac gluten sensitivity. It affects a whole lot of people much more than celiac disease. And yes, we now know there's this thing, FODMAP sensitivity, that you'll be hearing more about in the next few years as more scientists start researching FODMAPs. Uh, thank you for that. Because, the tra I mean, you look at how pharmaceuticals do uh, their studies, and what they'll do is they'll factor out low placebo, uh, uh, basically people that, that have... Uh, placebo interaction. I'm trying to remember the word right now. I'm blanking on it. Responders. So like high placebo responders are taken out immediately because if you have any sort of capacity to believe that what you're taking is going to make you better, yeah. um, you're out. Right? right. And so then they'll, they'll, they'll bring it all the way down to the people that are convinced that nothing's going to help them. And then even then, most of these studies uh, for these pharmaceuticals eke out maybe 1% or 2% above placebo, and they're barely yes. working, right? Yes. And so there's yes. a lot of fudging of science, and you know, this isn't the, the, the exact forum for that here, but you know, there's a lot of interests out there that want this gluten thing to go away. Um, and uh, we'll run with a, a story like that because it serves them financially, uh, exactly. but it doesn't serve you or your family if you're listening to this, right? Exactly right. It, it does not. It puts your family at grave risk because if they've got antibodies to their brain, if that's the weak link to the chain, and you don't know that because they're not demonstrating a lot of other symptoms, and so you, you suspect it, maybe gluten isn't so good for my son, but now you read the paper and uh, he was checked for celiac disease, but they did the blood test that's only positive when the total bilis atrophy is there. And the doctor said, no, look, he doesn't have celiac disease. Gluten's fine. And now you read that there's no such thing as non-celiac gluten sensitivity. You keep giving your child pizza. Uh, gluten, <laughs> right, pizza, and the result is the kid may have attention deficit right. or he, he may have seizures or he may have depression. Listen, children. Diagnosed with celiac disease have a 40% increased risk of suicide compared to non-celiac kids. 40% increased risk. I mean, it's just unacceptable. We just want accurate information out there to get tested properly. That's all. That's it. Guys, you heard it from the doctor himself. Uh, 
Dr. Tom O'Brien, thank you so much for just kicking it down. Uh, the wisdom that you have is just, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, Dr. Tom travels the world. He's, he's the guy who's teaching the teachers. He's teaching the doctors about this stuff, and he's the go-to person on it. So really honored to have you had taken the time and shared with our, our audience. And yes, I would take you up on that offer. I would really, really, really love to... Um, get some recipes or things that could help people get uh, from point A to point B. Tell me where people can find you. Sure. Um, our website is thedr.com, thedoctor.com. There's lots of interviews that we've done there, um, lots of handouts. Uh, we'll be happy to work with your team and put a package together so that you can make it available to your guys. Uh, uh, how do you implement this? How, how do you start moving in that direction? Love it. Love it. Yeah. I mean, we're here to help. The movie was to shake people up. And now the summit is about creating uh, solutions, lasting solutions that can really kind of take you from point A to point B. So uh, I appreciate everything that you're doing. Uh, Thedoctor.com, thedr.com. Great uh, domain, by the way. Um, And uh, you guys look him up. He is a a voice uh, of reason in the industry. And he's one that a lot of the smartest doctors in the world are following. Uh, for good reason. Dr. Tom O'Brien, thank you so much for your time and and sharing of your wisdom with us. Oh, Pedram, thank you, man. It's a real honor to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you.